Fear is a universal emotion common to every species on Earth, so it's unsurprising that horror in fiction has such a divided audience base. I've barely even scratched past the tip of this particular iceberg, despite the amount of horror fiction in my arsenal at the time of writing and recording. <laughs> I haven't watched all of them, alright? <laughs> there are those who get into horror for a thrill, or to gain a better understanding of what fear is, or even just because of a base fascination with what scares people. Growing up, I wasn't much of a horror buff. I generally avoided horror as a genre until very much recently. It's due to a lot of things, the popularization of cheap jump scares being chief among them, but in general, I was uninterested with what Hollywood horror was trying to say because I never resonated with the fears they were trying to represent. So it's safe to say that I'm not really much of a thrill seeker. <laughs> And I'm fine with that. What I look for in horror is mostly an understanding of the stain that fear leaves. The footprint in the sand, whatever you want to call it, the impact it leaves is always what fascinates me more. For example, Mike Flanagan's Bly Manor, a ghost story that focused mostly on trying to uncover what exactly love is, regardless of how terrifying it seems from the outside. Because a ghost story is inherently always going to be a character study. Despite how it ends, or maybe in spite of it, ghost stories will always focus on the haunting at hand, is always rooted in regret and wanting stagnancy in the face of inevitable change. A ghost story is about fear, whether of the audience, of the character being haunted, or of the character doing the haunting. Fear of the unknown and the known rooted in a very concentrated fear of the self. Fun Xiao was a video game by Red Candle Games, released in 2017. It was a film produced by One Production Film Co., Asmic Ace, and Film Magic Pictures, directed by John Shu, released in 2019. It was a TV series produced by Outland Film Productions, directed by Su Ishuan, Chuang Xiang An, and Liu Yi, released in 2020. Fan Xiao, translated literally as Return to School and better known to many as Detention, is a story set in 1960s Taiwan during the height of the White Terror, a period when Taiwan was under the rule of the Chinese Nationalist Party, when it persecuted those that allegedly promoted leftist and or communist thinking oppose the government in any way possible, or any other excuse they saw fit. The tension, in turn, is about Fang Reixin and her junior, Wei Chengting, who both wake up on the Greenwood High School campus in the middle of a typhoon, only to realize that there is no way out. There is more to the story, of course, and I do want to tell everyone verbally before we head into it that this video will contain heavy spoilers for all iterations of the tension and a very in-depth conversation about death, depression, suicide, abuse, torture, and fully grown adults dating minors. Heed the warnings, because I am not kidding about any of them. Anyway, the footage I took from has no commentary and the game isn't voice acted, so you guys can like go watch it in your own spare time or play it. It's available on Steam and Switch, if I recall correctly. Uh, you can pirate the film or whatever, and the series is also up on Netflix for now. I don't know if they let it be on Netflix for Americans. I know the American government and the Chinese government have like a secret handshake going on about like not acknowledging Taiwan as its own country, so maybe it isn't on Netflix for Americans. Anyway, <laughs> if seeing me play the game is something you're all interested in, I could arrange that. Uh, if I have this out after my initial stream, I can technically stream the game and post the highlights here. I'll put a cut here of what I'm streaming right now so I can give you the little card with the link to the channel I put the streams in. Again, if you're all interested in seeing me play the tension live, tell me in the comments and I'll put it on the queue after I catch up with FS2. This is a game I've only really experienced secondhand unlike oxen free so i'd love it if i could get to experience it firsthand and i will do it with the appropriate endorsement now with that out of the way let's get into the nitty-gritty of this
The tension has the story structure of your typical short story, which is a normal format for a lot of ghost stories because of the way the exposition drops. Turning of the Screw, the story they adapted Bly Manor from, is a prime example for that. All in all, the tension's gameplay lasts around 3 hours, so it's a short and appropriately horrific game. It sets up the core characters, the setting, and the tone it'll be using, then it starts unraveling the mysteries it gave you while it was doing this to begin with. They also execute it with little to no dialogue between characters using mostly environmental storytelling and the acquisition of items to tell the story for you. I do have the slight inkling that this style was inspired by Cat Lady, another psychological horror game, this one developed by Harvester Games back in 2012. It's a side-scroller, it's story-driven, it's about a ghost or zombie. Anyhow, the art styles are somewhat similar as well as the way they handle the cutscenes with this integration of like edited black and white and the occasional pop of color to fit the tone. But the main difference is that Cat Lady was fully voice acted and is a lot more explicit about its supernaturalness. The tension shies away from that, despite being very explicitly a story about a ghost. There are moments of spirituality here and there, especially the parts where Ration mirrors her mother and prays to the city god for guidance. There are also creatures like the Lantern Man and the Lingard, but the similarities end there. The tension focuses mostly on the way the White Terror affected the way these people lived, and how even one innocuous mistake in that time had cost lives. So, to give you the rundown, Ration's father becomes a drunk and starts cheating. Her parents fight, her grades suffer, she meets Mr. Zhang. They start a relationship instead of him actually helping her through this tough time. Her mother hires a private investigator to dig up dirt before the abuse got even worse. She reports Mr. Fang and gets him arrested for alleged bribery. Miss Yin, Ration's homeroom teacher, finally notices Zhang and tells him to think about the book club, to stop pursuing the relationship because it's bad and terrible. Ration tries to get rid of Miss Yin by exposing the book club, asks her junior Chung Ding for the list. Ration turns the list in to Inspector Bai. Bai thanks her for her patriotism. Miss Yin leaves the country and gets blacklisted. Zhang and the book club get arrested. Zhang gets executed. The others die in prison during the torture, except for Wei Jungting, who was given a pardon for pleading guilty. He ends up getting a sentence of 15 years. Ration kills herself in her grief and guilt, but only after getting rewarded for her patriotism. This game commits to the idea that I've only seen Mike Flanagan explore in his ghost stories, which was why I brought him up. Time moves differently for the dead in this story. Processing the memories leading up to their deaths can make no sense to the human brain because it jumps from moment to moment, never leading up to the whole. Your goal is to piece together whatever you can before it jumps to the next moment, and the downside to that is you get to the next moment and you don't remember what was happening before it, just what they've been feeling at the time that it was happening at all, if, if that makes sense. You're in their memory, so you don't know that there was a moment before this, you know? <laughs> Does that make sense? That makes sense. You guys, you guys know it. Okay. For better or for worse, depending on the ending you get, Ration uncovers her death, the reason she's trapped in Greenwood to begin with. The player, as Ration, has to make the choice between accepting the responsibility of having snitched for a selfish reason and maintaining her need to be selfish to the very end and wanting to forget that it happened at all. And the themes they use are so smart about it, even if most of the poeticisms of the story get lost in translation. Zhang compares her to a white daffodil, a narcissus, selfish and vain but flourishing under the attention given to her. Most of the time people would take that as an insult, I mean it's narcissus for Christ's sake. Do you really want to get compared to the most self-absorbed person in all myth? But no, it, it makes sense. There's a selfishness to depression that most people rarely take the time to consider. The closest I've seen people address it is when it comes to suicide. But that makes it an outward problem. It makes it about how you should think about how your family or friends will take it. Depression makes you feel like you're the center of the universe, and that the universe fucking hates you. That's the end-all be-all. Something goes wrong, someone starts distancing themselves from you, no one talks to you, no one likes you. It's not going to be because of your actions, it's going to be because of you. You're the reason things are going wrong. You're the reason people hate you. 
That's why a lot of depression talk is centered on worth and value. Ration had to sit through months and years of her parents yelling and beating at each other. The abuse never extended to her, of course, but she reasoned that it was because of her that things were like this, a topic that will get brought up again, we'll come back to that. And when she finally had someone who cared for her, it was Mr. Zhang, the school counselor whose job really was just to check up on her, to see why her grades were failing. But instead, she flourished under that seemingly undivided attention. Mr. Zhang saw her for who she was and appreciated her for it. And when Miss Yin decided that enough was enough and Mr. Zhang actually acknowledged and accepted that, Raishin snapped. The one good thing that ever happened to her had just been taken away from her. And now she was back to having nothing to look forward to. None of this, of course, justifies the horrors that followed. Raishin's reasons from a logical standpoint are selfish in the most negative and hideous sense, but it is human. The energy she could have put into killing herself was put into putting others in harm. If Zhang had just done his job properly, arguably we wouldn't even be in this mess. And it's in that frustration, in the cynical if-onlys that make the visual metaphor of a stage so brilliant. This is a tragedy. Sad as it is, all tragedies have the illusion of being preventable. I've seen a few reviewers get frustrated by Zhang or Xin for their selfishness say that the personal drama or lover's spat caused lives. It's funny that they say that because they're seeing the forest for the trees here. These were extraordinary circumstances in every negative sense of those words. Selfishness like that is such a necessary human right, it should be inviolable. Selfishness like that is what activists fight for. The trivialities of personal drama and taboo relationships get lost the moment you put them under the stifling pressure of a society under a fascist martial law. If the martial law hadn't existed, Mr. Zhang would have been reported for dating a student and gotten his license revoked. The book club wouldn't have been put into unnecessary scrutiny. Hell, Miss Yin wouldn't even have looked that deep into it, would have minded her own business if not for the safety of the kids in their book club. Raishin wouldn't have even gotten the idea of reporting the book club if not for the martial law, because it wouldn't have been something her mother was able to do. Though Detention is a ghost story is, is a character study of Raishin, it's also a time capsule. It's also a play. It's also a poem that bears repetition. Now, despite being a fairly faithful adaptation, the film made its own interesting decisions. For one, the regret was divided. Though Raishin is haunted by herself and her decisions and her own willful ignorance of her actions, Jingting is also put under some scrutiny, and it's a decision that had its pros and cons. The venue of the game was given a a bit of a literal interpretation. They turned this Greenwood campus looking limbo into a kind of halfway point for spirits, very the border between the life and death -y. While Rei Xin was struggling with the consequences of her actions like she was in the game, Chung Teng had to struggle with the consequences of his. After all, he'd been the one who'd given Rei Xin the list in the first place. And after all, he'd been the only one left of the people in the book club. I like the decision of exploring Chung Teng's survivor's guilt and his fury at Rei Xin. It gave some of the player base some vindication, at least if they'd watched the film. Jingding is still as polite and nice as ever, but they managed to make a character out of his politeness from the game and the smatterings of moments that involved him. This detracted a little from Rei Xin. For one, the decision to make her aware that she was dead from the get-go and was progressively just getting more and more vehement about denying why she was dead in the first place. It's an inspired choice, but it took what had been an exploration of her character and the reasons she would have forgotten all of this and turned her selfishness into something a little more selfish. Like yeah, in the game she was selfish, but they just made her less sympathetic by doing that, you know? And trust me, this is a trend that keeps going. Put a pin on that. I do think that they missed the chance of being able to explore more of Jing Ting's character by turning Miss Yin into a martyr. There's a scene in the game where Chung Ting and his fellow club member are burning books and are talking about what's going on with the book club. His friend suggests that so-and-so had leaked the list. Chung Ting, knowing he was the leak in the first place, tells him to shut up about it. But during this scene, they talk about Miss Yin too, about how she'd left the country. His friend says something about how unnerving it is that they didn't even have anywhere to escape to. Miss Yin, who was the principal's daughter, had some immunity despite being someone with the same goals as them. 
people who just want liberty in whatever form they can attain it. And this conversation harkens back to an earlier moment in the game when it was revealed that Miss Yin hadn't been able to return to Taiwan until her death. Again, this was set in the 60s. The White Terror lasted up until, what, the early 90s? 30 entire years later? They adapted this scene in the movie too, with both boys having a f heartfelt moment among the burning Joss paper and books. But they, they kind of just ignore that little moment of envy. They commiserate in their sad fates. Then big monster Inspector Bai comes out of the woods and kills Chung Ting's friend, who I think is a metaphor for the White Terror too. He also, I think, adapted from one of the monsters in the game. But I can't be too sure. With leaving out that moment, I think it just kind of plays too much into how Chung Ting and the rest of the book club members are like perfect victims. And while it is true that there are activists like that, the book club wasn't an activist group. These were just kids who wanted to read. They weren't entirely aware of the magnitude of that until things got too real too fast. I say this with the express knowledge that there are people out here in the Philippines who didn't understand what was going on during our martial law because of how young they were, were ignorant of how incredibly harmful it had been to most people who had been alive in that time. A majority of the time, people who get reported and spirited away by the government were never heard from again, most of them having gone missing officially. Like, didn't even have a body left to bury missing officially. And despite these sorry fates, they're met with nothing but contempt for having broken the law in the first place. Unless, you know, you want to be open about being supportive of these people or, like, sharing some grief. And then people will start calling you a commie. In this day and age, calling you a commie? Yes, that's, this is a thing that exists. I don't know, that might be a nitpick, but I kind of wanted that humanizing and selfish moment between the book club members because it makes them seem less like heroes, you know? Makes them more relatable. That even in the shittiest of circumstances, you still see someone leaving instead of facing the music with you as selfish because of your own envy. Another thing that they changed was that Mr. Fung was apparently like some big figure in the military and despite the abuse they'd been experiencing because of his vehement denial of his cheating on his wife, Ray Shin still wanted him back and was terrified of her mother for having reported her husband in the first place. Your mileage may vary, but if the guy's been abusing your mother and has been cheating on her, I think some reciprocation of the monstrosity is warranted. I don't know, it could just be me. Anyway, minor details aside, with making the Greenwood Campus Limbo a metaphysical, literal, spiritual place, they managed to fit both the good and bad endings into the film, which was honestly very smartly done. <laughs> <laughs> Big kudos to John Shu, Fu Kai Ling, and Cheng Shi Kang for how they adapted it. it. It's just very brilliant. No wonder they won awards for this. After Ray Shin's decision to finally face the music after wallowing in her guilt for so long, there is a very literal battle against Big White Terror metaphor Inspector Bai and Ray Shin. Uh, and she kind of lets Chung Ting leave and she stays behind in some redemption after death situation. And this weird dream slash nightmare is what gets Chung Ting past, past the torture and 15 years in jail. It's a, it's a weird narrative decision, but I respect it. You know, it's still a very smart move. Now, there are a couple more details in the film that I want to talk about, but I can't talk about them without talking about... The tension in the series is set in the limbo between the good and bad endings, so about 30 years after Ration died. Greenwood is still up and running, Inspector Bai is still the Prefect of Discipline, but the old building was shut down after Ration committed suicide on campus and we're finally in a semi-modern setting. We have our protagonist Liu Yincheng, a girl who moved in from the city due to a variety of reasons, chief among them a series of events that led to a mental break that led to a bout of psychosis. Her mother is struggling as well, having a cheating husband who is now living with his mistress instead, and puts the onus on Yincheng to be a better person and to bring him back. Our deuteragonist is Zheng Menyang, Chung Ting's nephew, a very odd considering they don't share a surname, whose family runs the local temple to the city god and is a descendant of a long line of exorcists, apparently. He meets Yin Sheng on the roof of the building where they were just being themselves and masking for a moment of fresh air. And while this was happening, a fellow classmate of theirs who, I think, fellow classmate? A fellow schoolmate of theirs, also wearing the devil tag on her, jumped off the roof just right in front of them. A series of events happen where history repeats itself. The show kind of features Ray Shin as this vengeful spirit now, and the world building actually makes sense despite a bit of its cheesiness that goes with it. 
She's still stuck in her loop, but now she's living vicariously through Yunsheng, who is literally kindred spirit. Rishen sees herself in Yunsheng, a girl who feels a responsibility to keep her parents together, likes to write poetry, and fell in love with the teacher in charge of the book club. They're literally cut from the same cloth. But there's a problem with that. So... To give you the rundown, again, this is starting to feel like Into the Spider-Verse. The tension starts in 1992. Yu Yun-chang moves into the town with her mother, and she transfers into Greenwood High for a fresh start. From the get-go, you do get the idea that Yun-chang is being pressured into doing something she doesn't want to by her mother. As the story progresses, she meets Zheng Wenyang, who likes her more when she's not pretending to be someone she's not. <laughs> A uh, running theme in all prop all iterations of this property for some reason. She gets possessed by bad ending Ration, who she strikes an immediate liking to for letting her be a better writer and making her not rely on her anti-psychosis meds. Ration takes advantage of her and relives her love story with Mr. Zhang through Shenhua and Yin Shang. Wen Yang gets a wind of this and immediately tries to tear Ration and Yin Shang apart once he realizes that Ration is the same girl his uncle hasn't gotten over for years now. Worst comes to worst when Shenhua sexually assaults Yin Shang. Mr. Yu comes on site to make him pay. They lose the trial when they reveal that Yin Shang uses antipsychotics. Yin Shang snaps and commits suicide, surrendering her body over to Ration. Ration enacts her revelation. Revenge plot against Inspector Bai. Cheng Ting finally gets on campus and tries to appeal to Ray Shin and reconcile with his conflicting emotions from what happened 30 years ago. Yun Chang plays the tension in the game while inside Ray Shin's head. Ray Shin reveals that the other reason she got attached to Yun Chang is because Yun Chang has her own guilt ridden reasons of why she's at Greenwood in the first place, having met with her father's mistress behind her mother's back. Eventually reaching the good ending, the story ends with Yun Chang finally integrating to life in this town, happy with her mother and the company she keeps with Wen Yang. There's a lot, but it all makes sense. I promise the series is good with all the context involved. It's a whirlwind of ideas. It drives me up the wall. Ration, Jung Ting, and Inspector Bai all have similar arcs of realizing that they're not living in that time anymore. That this cycle of abuse and hurt and vengeance is, for better or for worse, for nothing now. And stubbornly sticking to the ideas and behaviors that they had at the time is doing more harm than good to the people looking forward to the lives ahead of them, and to themselves. It's true that their actions had consequences, that the hurts they felt and inflicted in turn had left scars that still fester, but keeping them to the forefront won't let these hurts heal nor will it make them feel better about themselves. It's an admonishing angle to the selfishness theme that they stuck to in the video game, and it is actually a very common phenomenon. People acting in envy of the things they fought tooth and nail for act out in ways that might hurt more than help, and their envy ends up becoming its own self-perpetuating monster. Rishin and Chung Ting are the perfect avatars for this. Both had to go through some really depressing shit and now have to process that the emotions they're acting on go on without the context that they were wrought from, like being haunted by their own emotional ghosts. It's a very PTSD thing. And this arc develops beside the very real problems cropping up in Yin Chang's life. What I really like about the series in retrospect, because I did actually watch this one before I watched the film, is that they committed and acknowledged the stuff that the other formats couldn't. The game was short and simple, something an indie studio could pull off with a relatively small budget. The film had to adapt a story that ran on little to no dialogue and was mostly environmental storytelling within the hour to two hour span. So the series actually had the time and space to address the shit that they couldn't in their short story formats. And... <sighs> okay, hold on. <laughs> this was something the film did too that I didn't like. And it was hiring attractive men to play the teacher who took advantage of a teen under considerable mental stress. I mean, look at Chang Ming Hui. <laughs> look at Chang Ming Hui for, from both the film and the series. What the fuck? I know he's an idealist who touted liberty above all, but turning him into that when he's literally just some bad, like some sad boy who likes to read books? Shenhua is at least an acquired taste looking guy. Like, he doesn't look like husbando bait for all those thirsty teenagers, but since teens will thirst over anyone who isn't entirely too macho or patronizing, he's alright, you know? And when he sexually assaults Yun Cheng, he never seems attractive ever again. And no, this isn't just me flaming the casting. This is an actual problem because there is no part of the game that ever actually romanticized Chang and Ration's relationship. All it ever shows you is the 
generation's perspective as this downtrodden teen who wanted positive attention that she never got from anyone from her family. And since gathering was a bad thing to do, it wasn't something she ever got from friends either. Whatever angle you look at, this relationship was wrought from a want to be selfish and it brought nothing but heartbreak and death from either side. This was what I meant in the Fandoms Hate Friends video when I said that a romantic subplot is symbolic of the overall plot. The tension is about selfishness and its good, bad, and ugly sides. It's about cherishing the taboo in a time when everything is taboo except the shit that should be. And finding a way to make Rei Shin and Chang and Shenhua and Yun Chang's relationship palatable beats the purpose of even making these these relationships happen at all because the point isn't that their love story is compelling no bestie it's disgusting <laughs> these grown men took advantage of these children and even tried to justify the actions they were taking and because shen hua isn't a freedom fighter like chang was he gets the storyline where he sexually assaults young Sheng. do you see what i'm saying here and i do appreciate the team behind the series for addressing the problem behind a teacher pursuing a student like that but despite that they still ended with rei shin reconciling with her feelings for chang in his final moments and it's given the same level of reverence as they gave him in the game and the film i understand understand why. Mr. Chang and the book club members represent a demographic of Taiwanese people who didn't want to live under an oppressive regime. Of course, they were given some sort of respect while sent out, but it kind of just cancels out what they did with Shenhua and Yin Chang's arc. Alright, with that out of the way, we're running full circle back to Yin Chang and Rei Shin. We're, we're, we're taking the pin out now. Another thing they changed in the series is the amount of responsibility they gave Rei Shin for her father's arrest before everything happened. In the original, her mother hired a private investigator and had Mr. Fung arrested for giving public officials bribes or something. This didn't affect Rei Shin in the slightest, but it did inspire her into turning in the book club to get rid of Miss Yin. In the series, they changed up some things. Putting Greenwood High in the provincial mountain village school heightens the probability that Mrs. Fang was illiterate, and since this was set in the 60s and there were some things in Rei Shin's room that were her mother's dowry, that's not too big of a jump to make. But in making Rei Shin be responsible for her father's arrest, it kind of makes the inclusion of that moment of arresting her father a moot point. If the decision to turn her father in came from her, then she could have easily just done that with the book club without having arrested her father at all. This was a decision they made mostly to just connect Rei Shin and Yin Chang more, because Yin Chang is also misremembering her part in her father's departure from their household to make herself feel more pitiful. Rei Shin and Yin Chang's minds want them to misremember these events to justify the trauma they're undergoing in the household. Rei Shin wants to make it seem like she's the victim in this situation, having to live with her single, illiterate mother who reported her husband for years of abuse and neglect. Yin Chang wants to make it seem like it's all her fault that her dad left and that her mom hates her because of it. And without an outside perspective from either of their sides, they they wouldn't have acknowledged these misremembrances continue wallowing in irrational self-pity. Still, again, it makes Rei Shin seem less sympathetic than she actually is, because that wasn't a trauma that she could just misremember for her own mental stability. Unlike the act of reporting the book club, which plagued her with guilt and shame up until the moment of her death, feeling responsible for her philandering, drunken, deadbeat dad is not something that ever happened. It's the same with Yin Sheng, choosing to forget why she felt so guilty for her heartbroken mother. The guilt of having betrayed her trust behind her back to meet up with her dad's mistress is a secret she's been harboring for years. When the guilt built up and the emotional abuse she got from her mother stacked on top, the psychotic break happened and her memory kept getting more and more warped until she actually believed the lie she told her mother to begin with. I think I made this comparison while I was watching these playthroughs, but it does remind me a bit of that specific aspect of Omori, that though I know dissociative amnesia doesn't just happen willy-nilly like that, and Reishin and Yin Chang don't commit to the idea of fantastical escapism in the face of guilt, they still had to make the difficult choice between running away from the truth and confronting and owning up to it. Overall, the tension is a well-written and rewritten story about memory and responsibility. It's about acknowledging the real over preferable fictions, about how even though you want perfect victims, these are just regular people that are being mythologized for no reason other than honoring the dead. You can like them for their achievements, for the heroism of their sacrifices, but you can't do that without acknowledging their shittier sides. And that's a bold thing to do for a story about a terrible, terrible era in Taiwanese history.
there's a lot of stuff I managed to leave out from this because good god this is long enough <laughs> like how much I just did not like the decision to make Chung Ting have this weird crush on Raishin they managed to make sense of it in the series with making them have a dynamic more similar to Yin Chang and Wen Yang but it was a fiction the film entertained even though it didn't have any bearing in the original context also Yun Chang and Wen Yang have more chemistry obviously God, there's also the fact that they reused the campus from the film for the series. That was such a nice easter egg for any viewers who may have played the game on top of like lines directly taken from the game itself. It's just, it's just really good. <laughs> but that's all for now. Uh, thanks for making it to the end. Like the video, comment, subscribe, etc. If you've seen the series, the film, or the game, tell me what you thought about it. And don't forget to comment if you, if you don't mind me playing the games for highlights and stuff. Uh, I'll make it fun for y'all. Voice act all the lines, even. Don't take my word for that. <laughs> Thanks again to my supporters. If you want to support me, good lord. If you want to support me further, my Kofi is open. Supporters will get a week early access to these videos, bloopers if I have them, files and links to things I read and watched to make this video, and more in the Discord server. And as always, stay safe. Ingatay lahat. Bye!